So good evening, everyone. I am Manali Patel, member of Lex Auxilium. Welcomes you all. Uh, welcomes you all on the behalf of Lex Auxilium and Just Corpus. The subject matter for today's uh, session is tips on how to crack the UGC net. Uh, and the resource person for the session is Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Sayantini Bakshi Bhattacharya. Hope you all are doing safe and healthy. I would like to introduce ma'am. Uh, Mrs. Sayantini is an alumnus of the University of Calcutta and National Law University, Odisha, and currently is pursuing her PhD from WB NUJ Kolkata. She specializes in constitutional law. She was a recipient of Mamraj Agrawal Rashtriya Puruskar, received from the Honorable Governor of West Bengal for securing the highest mark in her graduation. She has worked for the Center for Regulatory Studies, Governance, and Public Policy as a researcher. Ma'am has also worked with the School of Legal Studies, CMR University, Bangalore, as an assistant professor. Currently, she is an assistant professor and a faculty of constitutional law at National Law University, Jodhpur. Without taking much of the time, I would quickly like to introduce the organizer of today's session, Lex Auxilium and Just Corpus. Lex Auxilium aims to impart legal education and inculcate values that stand to ben uh, benefit the masses. We at Lex Auxilium aim to build a holistic environment for our subscribers by creating and maximizing opportunities for the law students uh, and aspiring lawyers. We wish to provide them with enriching opportunities that maximizes their career potential by hosting webinars, uh, online internships, and website publications. Uh, the just, just Corpus is a uh, general is a double blind uh, peer reviewed interdisciplinary e general. The uh, Just Corpus aims to bring the various accepts and chains of law under a single umbrella and provide service to the students. Just Corpus Law General publishes manuscripts in the field of law. Without taking much of the time, over to you, ma'am. Am I audible to you? Am I audible? Oh, yes, to you? All right. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Monali, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Team Lex Auxilium and uh, Team Just Corpus for the wonderful opportunity that you've uh, given me. And uh, I think. Uh, Okay, I would like to start with a disclaimer and that is uh, probably, I am no expert in, you know, importing uh, a kind of, a, you know, training in these matters, but I'm, I'm here to share my experience with all of you uh, watching this program today. So the entire uh, experience, you know, that, that uh, I've had of, uh, you know, till the time I had cleared this particular examination, was something and that that kind of taught me so many different things and uh, most importantly the thing that i learned from this entire exercise was that you need a lot of patience and you need to be very uh, strategic in your approach to clear this particular exam there is no point or there's no uh, a reason behind you to feel uh, anxious or to feel uh, you know low if you if you don't end up qualifying this paper in your first or second attempt but uh, what i feel is that you should be persistent and uh, you shouldn't lose hope and uh, you need to be very smart and of course along with uh, you know the hard work that you put in you also have to be very smart while you prepare for this particular exam. It's not only, you know, hard work that would, or that is likely to yield good results, but you also need to be smart, as I said. So this particular exam, that is uh, the NET exam, is conducted by the UGC. Right? So as we know that uh, UGC is the body which uh, kind of, you know, takes care of the entire, uh, 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 I mean, the, the domain of higher education and uh, with regard to, you know, how the universities will be governed and how uh, decisions would be taken, it issues several guidelines and, and it has, you know, a wide range of activities uh, that it kind of, you know, does. So 
UGC is the primary uh, body which kind of you know takes up this responsibility of conducting net. And uh, initially, it was uh, the CPSC which was you know entrusted with the responsibility of uh, conducting net. But gradually, it has been uh, entrusted to a different agency, that is the National Testing Agency, which conducts NET at this point of time. So we need to understand that <clears throat> NET can be for kind of, you know, there are two types here when we talk about NET primarily. The first one is for, let's say, the social science, uh, people belonging to the social science background, or let's say, uh, you know, humanities for that matter. And uh, there are other subjects as well, but there is another uh, net that is conducted purely for the science subjects. So uh, that is of course not very pertinent for our discussion today, but uh, what we have to understand is the pattern has undergone a bit of change. And uh, what is this change all about? See, initially, I mean, at the time when I had uh, the opportunity of clearing this paper, uh, there were kind of, you know, there were three uh, divisions in the paper. So there were three papers practically. First was the first paper that you still have right now. The second and the third papers were the law papers, right? And uh, the law papers were divided into two, right? One containing 50 marks, the first one, and the second would contain 75, I mean, 50 questions, I'm sorry. And the second one would have 75 questions and all of them were MCQs. So <clears throat> ultimately this was changed when NTA kind of took over. And now the pattern is a bit different. Now you no longer have OMR sheets. You have a computer-based test. And uh, at this point of time, as you can see that the papers have been clubbed into uh, two papers. I mean, the two law papers that we had have been clubbed into one. So there's one first paper and the second uh, paper, which is purely the paper relating to your specialization area. So for us, it is the law paper, which we specialize in, right? So apart from this, it is also very important for us to look at several technical factors, which are, uh, you know, relevant here in this case. The first and the foremost factor here is what is the eligibility? Now, in order to be eligible to appear for NET, you need to uh, you know, either be you need to you need to pursue your masters during. I mean, while doing your masters, you can appear for net. But that would be, I mean, if you clear it, it is subject to the uh, result of yours that you that you obtain in your masters. And once you qualify your masters with fifty five percent minimum, your net. I mean, the exam that you've already qualified, let's say, that is kind of confirmed. Right. So uh, either you can do it that way, or if you already have a masters in a particular field, then you can, obviously you, you need to have that 55% cutoff. So that is important. So immediately after that, you are eligible to appear for NET. So this is, this, this is a very important thing that I wanted to talk about. Now, the next thing is that, what is the ultimate purpose that this entire concept of NET serves? NET is basically nothing, but it is the minimum criteria that is required. And it helps you to, uh, you know, uh, apply for, you know, lecturership uh, wherever you want to, like across India. And uh, it's the minimum criteria that is required. And uh, here there is another important information that I would like to share. That is at times we are a bit confused about NET and JRF. It's a junior research fellowship. So NET and JRF are nothing but it's the same exam that uh, is conducted. But the cutoff that is there for GRF is a bit higher when compared to NET. So generally, this cutoff varies right, uh, from, I mean, it, I mean, from year to year it varies. And uh, let's say if you appear or let's say if you apply for GRF and NET, so you have two options that are given to you. One is NET and one is NET and GRF. So if you're smart enough to apply for NET and GRF, there is no need to feel that if you don't qualify for GRF, you will automatically be out of the game. No, it's not like that. If you don't appear, I mean, if you don't qualify for GRF and you still qualify for the uh, for, for net, you will be a net uh, holder or you will be net qualified in that case, right? But if you end up getting a, a slightly higher percentage, then of course, GR, you are GRF qualified. But here, there is an important thing. 
net is something which is preliminary that is required for you to apply for the post of assistant professor or lecturership at least in i mean in higher education sector in the universities or colleges across india and uh, most importantly <clears throat> most importantly uh, jrf right jrf the ones who clear jrf they are eligible to go for research right so research in the sense uh, you you ideally take up research and you pursue your phd right and there's a particular span i mean till the time you complete your phd the government pays a certain amount of stipend to you so that may range from let's say uh, 25000 rupees to 30000 rupees so the first uh, initial years you are uh, appointed as let's say or let's say you 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 become the junior research <clears throat> fellow but gradually as you go you become the senior research fellow and then you procure your phd so it's a full time work that that you have when it comes to jrf right so you're not supposed to be like let's say working in a particular institution as a net holder right let's say as a lecturer and simultaneously pursue your phd so both the things cannot be done simultaneously but yes remember that net is a degree that you have for your lifetime right and it's it's something that will be there for you it will be there with you uh, i mean even if you have jrf or you don't or you're done with your phd the net is the basic minimum qualification that you require so this is uh, something important that i had to say about the technical considerations now anyone can apply as i said uh, but yeah in in india you must be seeing or you must have come across situations where uh, we had experiences where let's say phd uh, degree holders phd degree holders uh, the ones who have their phd they are the ones who would probably uh, they they will be appointed as assistant professors and they can do away with this requirement of net i mean if somebody does not have a net and but has a phd then the person will automatically be considered for the post of an assistant professor so in that case net is not a minimum criteria now these these are certain technical uh, aspects of uh, net now i come to the most important part and i i think uh, this is something that we all must uh, you know kind of think about and that is how to go about preparing for the papers that are there in this particular exam so at times uh, like from my personal experience i have felt that you know at times you feel very low because you are unable to clear it in your first attempt so i have been able to clear it in my third attempt so i have not been it but it's not like you know uh, it's it's like it's like a lesson that you learn in the process right it's not like okay you lose hope because once at once or let's say at one go you're not able to clear the paper it's not like that right there are there are tremendously uh, good students i've seen or let's say students with tremendous potential they are unable to clear net uh, i mean even even let's say at the fifth or sixth attempt but that's not a big deal that doesn't determine whether you are a, a meritorious candidate or you are or not so that's not a, the determining factor but because it's the minimum requirement prescribed by the ugc so we need to clear this right so there is nothing to feel bad about the fact that no i couldn't clear my net at the first attempt so now coming to the pattern that we see as i said there are two papers the first paper is the first paper is paper 1 which is dealing with the uh, you know the basic it's an aptitude based uh, general kind of a paper which is applicable for all the people all the uh, you know uh, aspirants of this particular examination they will they will all have to appear for this particular paper now in this particular exam that you have you have uh, kind of you know uh, several parts which are existing here now let's say there is a theoretical part and uh, there is a you know practical i mean there is a there is a theoretical part and a practical part as well now when we talk about the theoretical part in the first paper that we see we see that there are things like teaching aptitude you know teaching aptitude which talks about uh, the basic elements that are required uh, you know in this particular profession i mean uh, how how what would be the teaching pedagogy or uh, what are the methods that you adopt while teaching or let's say what are you know you, you need to understand the perspectives of both the teacher and the learner and also the student so from their perspectives questions are asked right so uh, let's say now they've introduced some new uh, elements into this uh, first paper 
which talks about certain uh, methods of teaching in, in higher uh, learning, which would include, let's say, uh, online methods, you know, like SWAM or let's say SWAM Prabha. So they have questions with regard to uh, these things also. They also have questions in the first part regarding, let's say, how you go about evaluating things, right? So you have certain evaluative techniques, how you go about implementing these evaluative techniques and how you evaluate, right, a student's performance. So now, let's say this is one which is important, or let's say you come to research aptitude. Now, when you talk about research aptitude, uh, I'm sure students who are pursuing law and they have done their masters, they have had a paper for their uh, masters, which is titled as a research methodology. And research methodology is a subject which teaches you the basics of research because you step into the uh, field of academics and research is the, is, is, the, is the first step that you take. So you have a kind of a, you know, a kind of a privilege uh, over and above the ones who haven't been taught research methodology. So there are several books which are available on research, like uh, research aptitude primarily. Like for example, to give you certain examples, like if I say, what are the types of research, right? Or let's say we have heard about qualitative research, we've heard about quantitative research, we have heard about the concepts of hypothesis, we have heard about you know techniques of research, right? So there are several ways, you know, what are the steps that are involved in research? How do you go about uh, experimenting with different data? And, and things like that. So research aptitude is again, you can take up, you need not be, you know, uh, I mean, you need not restrict yourself to legal research, but research in general, right? Even if you are a student of law appearing for paper one, you need to talk about or you need to learn or focus on, you know, uh, let's say the basics of research, right? The basics of research as, as in research in social science or humanities, I think that is enough for you to, uh, I mean, when you, when you cover, try to cover this topic of research aptitude. There's another section called uh, the comprehension part. Now in the, in the comprehension part, you will see that there is a passage given to you along with a certain number of questions. So what you do is firstly, the moment you get that question paper, you start reading it, right? And reading it is not a general reading that you do. Always remember during, I mean, starting, from the first minute till the last minute, you need to be extremely alert when you read the question, because reading the question is very important because see at times we, not, we might not be in a position to know every answer possible. So in that case, what we do is we try to think, we try to deliberate, we try to, we try to reflect, and then we come up with something which, is, which could probably be the answer. It need not necessarily be the answer that is, you know, that is very clear in our mind. But by applying our common sense or by, by applying our thinking in a, in, a, you know, in a prudent manner, we reach that conclusion that yes, this could be the answer. And then you finally come up with the answer sheet and then you see that yes, what you thought was correct. It led you to the correct conclusion. So that would be something really good. And uh, comprehension, as I said, the moment you get the question paper, you, it appears on the screen, make it a point that you read Right? You read the comprehension, you read the passage very, very clearly. So once you are done with the reading of the passage and then quickly take a look at the questions, the ones who are not very well equipped uh, you know, uh, with these things, what makes you perfect is, is practice. Right? So the moment you start practicing, the moment you kind of you know, develop the habit of reading things uh, as rapidly as possible, you automatically, you know, your mind gets alert. So you read the passage quickly, look at the questions, and then at the back of your mind, it keeps running. You know, by the time you ultimately reach that part while solving the answers, your mind already has somehow, you know, kind of identified what could be the probable answers. So that is about comprehension. With regard to communication, again, let's say the, the, the fourth unit which deals with communication, it talks about several things, like for example, how to effectively communicate. Right? What could be? What what are the possible barriers to communication? Right? Uh, and and this is all from the perspective of let's say uh, a researcher, let's say a teacher, all from those perspectives. Right? Not only from their perspective, but also from the perspective of the learner. Right? So what you think could be let's say a barrier to an effective communication? Right? So what are the aids to effective communication? How do we go about? you know, enhancing the quality of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, things that we deliver, 
right? The quality of the of the things we speak. So how do you go about improving on that? So that is a part of communication. Now, you know, you have, let's say, when you talk about uh, the other theoretical aspects, you have questions from higher education system, you have questions from environment, right? Which is again, very, very important. So we be very well aware of different developments that are taking place. People, this, this thing is very important that you must be aware of, and that is all the contemporary developments happy, happening all around. You know, you should be alert, you should be aware of those developments. Let's say with respect to all the uh, different protocols, the different agreements, the different conventions that come up in the in the field of environmental law. So you are a student of, uh, let's say, uh, law, and you have the privilege of studying things like, let's say, the Kyoto Protocol, or let's say the, uh, you know, the Rio Summit, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this privilege of knowing many things which the others might not be knowing. So uh, I think you have the liberty to do this. Also, information and communication technology. I'm sure we all have studied the Information and Communication, the Information Technology Act. And as a part of that, right, we are somehow, to some extent, I mean, you know, acquainted uh, uh, with the basics of information and communication technology. We know the basics, right? So you just need to brush up certain things. Though, though those are absolutely legal matters, but we know, need to know the basics. So what you can do is you can procure for yourself let's say a long list of abbreviations, right? What are these, what do these stand for? So if you have that list ready before you, you just take a quick look at it, right? Maybe once once in a while, and then it automatically, your, your, your mind gets refreshed and you again uh, start remembering those things. So it's it's not, let's say the, the best part about uh, MCQ based questions is that you need not remember everything word by word. Right? Even if you have a kind of a you know vague idea about certain things, like you know that, okay, the meaning or let's say the abbreviation of this could be this. So you just have to take that. So it need not be the exact thing because you need not note it down, right? You need not write it down in the paper, but you need to click and that clicking should be done on correct lines. That is very important. Now talking about, let's say the basics of internet, or the kind of computers that were invented over time. What kind of computers were invented uh, over time? What are the digital initiatives that have been taken in the educational uh, domain, in the higher educational domain in India? These things are certain things where, which you will find in the different websites, in the different websites like UGC, or let's say, uh, you know, uh, I mean, where, where you basically have the digital data available, right, provided to you by the government of India or the government of different states. So directly visit those, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the websites and try to take down the information. So that would be a good way. So up till now, I was talking about theoretical uh, things. Now, if we come to, let's say, the, the practical aspects, the practical aspects would be, let's say, uh, okay, I missed out on another important thing that is logical reasoning, which again is something very important. And uh, probably it will come up with uh, so many things like Venn diagrams, or let's say they will, they will give you a, Kind of a proposition right and you have to come up with a reasoning so deductive inductive reasonings so you have to decipher the meaning of something from there so that's how you go about uh, you know applying your logic and your reasoning and then solving those questions now coming to the practical aspect you have things like data interpretation you have so many things like let's say uh, the mathematical uh, aptitude or mathematical reasoning whatever you call it so there you have some basic, uh, you know, kind of uh, basic questions that are asked to you. I mean, I think class 10, 9, 10 level is more than sufficient, right? So uh, for those things like, let's say, for example, ratio proportion, or let's say profit and loss, uh, discounting. So, of course, these things become very important because uh, ultimately these places are very, very scoring. So all that I had done was, uh, let's say, when I was preparing for this, so I was literally, there are, and you must be knowing that there are several YouTube channels. So I remember I was referring to a channel called Exams Race, and uh, they keep solving uh, the questions, the paper one questions, uh, BSI Academy, these two channels I was referring to while I was preparing. So these two channels helped me a great deal in kind of, you know, practicing things because they would practice it right on the screen. And I would sit with my pen and paper and I would, uh, simultaneously practice it on the piece of paper. 
so that kind of helped me you know uh, have a have a grip over the first paper which many of us who are uh, let's say like for me for for my, i mean my case I'm, i'm extremely poor in maths so that that fear of kind of practicing uh, these mathematical reasoning and aptitude that was always there but uh, as and when i started practicing things you know the solving venn diagrams or let's say uh, pie charts or or things like that so i started finding some interest when i saw that okay okay i'm i'm being able to right so keep doing it right from let's say you have all the previous year papers with you just figure out okay this portion is dealing with mathematical reasoning so today i will solve mathematical reasoning from all these papers let's say you take five papers so you solve them simultaneously and you see how well uh, or let's say how much you have improved in the process right so similarly if you are dealing with something called uh, let's say logical reasoning pick up the questions from logical reasoning and keep solving them at one go don't be like okay i'll solve everything today itself don't sit and think that i'm going to solve the entire paper uh, in one day right because because ultimately you need, you need to remember that you need to be consistent with what you are doing so let's say you are doing comprehension do three to four comprehensions at one go you're dealing with mathematical reasoning pick up some questions keep practicing them let's say three or four at a time you keep practicing them right so i think that's how uh, i i i was a bit confident when it came to my uh, first paper now uh, without wasting much time i'll 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 come to uh, you know the the preparation on the uh, main paper that is law and how i i kind of you know prepared myself for law now uh, i'm sure all of you have your uh, you know the syllabus that has been provided and uh, the syllabus has been changed uh, you know a little not uh, exactly uh, i mean not everything has been changed but uh, ultimately what you see is uh, that you know certain things have been incorporated which are in tune with the present day developments right so uh, of course we need to be updated all the time so after nda has taken over we can see that there are so many developments that have, uh, i mean they have added so i've seen some uh, some people they uh, kind of you know complain that they have added something that's uh, that we haven't ever studied so i've, I've i have always seen people complaining about this but uh, see what you need to think about is that net is the qualifying exam and you are not proving your worth as an expert in any particular field you are not proving your worth as an expert in any particular field why because ultimately if i have to study criminal law constitutional law international law uh, let's say uh, uh, comparative public law or information technology environmental law it is not possible right if you think over a period of 6 months you are going to sit and uh, you know kind of uh, become experts on each and every subject that i talk about you are under a mistaken belief it is not so that's where comes my basic idea that i mean the basic uh, thing that i wanted to talk about and that is you have to be very very strategic in your approach so let's say if i start with I'll, with some examples i'll i'll help you understand what i am basically trying to say so for example if i talk about uh, let's say jurisprudence so if i'm talking about jurisprudence you will see that uh, what i practically did was i had a privilege of uh, interacting with some uh, juniors of mine while i was preparing for net and they were just you know fantastic exceptional students who i mean in turn i learned from them so i used to sit and interact with them you know maybe weekly and uh, i used to discuss so many important uh, things let's say with respect to jurisprudence because i had studied jurisprudence way back in my during my llb but but uh, I, i didn't study it uh, you know with too much of attention of course but now as i had seen that uh, i had to be A, a lot more attentive when i study jurisprudence so what was the approach that i had taken the approach that i had taken was something like let's say the first day when i sat with the entire compendium of uh, let's say uh, the, the the entire question bank i was literally lost and uh, i was very very confident that i'm i'm never going to uh, clear this particular paper why because you know it's something which is beyond my capacity to kind of you know digest 
So what I did was I tried to try to relax and I sat with the question paper. I tried to figure out from which subject what I mean from I mean the subject and then the questions that have come from those subjects. So I sat with my uh, computer and I just kept typing the questions that I was seeing in the previous year. So let's say from jurisprudence, there are, let's say, a few questions. So I would type those questions in my computer. And then gradually, when I sit and study jurisprudence, I would try to see that, okay, this thing is from here, right? So in that case, you don't feel very low the moment you open the uh, question paper and you are totally clueless as to, as to what you're supposed to do. So ultimately, you have a set of questions that have come till date, right? Till date, these are the questions, let's say, that have come from something called, let's say, the analytical school of jurisprudence, right? So let's say questions from uh, the, the opinion expressed by Jeremy Bentham, or let's say Austin, or let's say, uh, you know, Hans Kelsen. So you have everything in one place. So tomorrow when you sit, sit and, and, and open the analytical school, and you start reading about Bentham, so automatically it clicks your mind that, okay, I've read this about Bentham. So just underline it. And people, one more important thing that uh, you can always do is sit with either people who are tech savvy can sit with their computers or people who think they are, uh, I mean, comfortable with a pen and paper, have a copy, right? Have two to three copies. And whenever you are reading something, read it completely. You don't have to read it like, okay, Bentham said this. And then all of a sudden from analytical school, you go to uh, the, let's say the philosophical school or let's say to the sociological school and you open, let's say Roscoe Pound and start reading about it. No, that's not going to help. It's going to further distract you. It's going to confuse you further. So kindly do not adopt that strategy. Take up analytical school, take up sociological school and see that there are certain favorites, right? If you, if you have seen the past year's question papers of NET, you will be seeing that there are some favorites, right? You will you will find a mention of people like let's say uh, let's say social contract theory, like uh, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, or let's say if you find mention of Roscoe Pound and his theory of social engineering, or let's say if you find uh, the theory of uh, Savini and his Wolf's uh, gaze theory that he propounded um, in the German context, or let's say you have uh, you know the Hart Fuller debate, which is based on positivism and natural law theory. These are some of the favorites. So what they have been doing is they have been asking questions. Uh, I mean, from these areas tentatively, right? So almost if you have fifty questions in place, which have come over a period of let's say ten years, I bet you will have at least you know uh, five to six questions common from those things that you have already compiled from those uh, previous year question papers. So that's something very interesting. And gradually what I also did was, I had kept one page for one jurist or thinker. Let's say for Samund, I keep one page. For Hans Kelsen and his theory, I kept one page. Another, let's say for Roscoe Pound's social engineering, I kept another page. So I used to keep these things and whatever material or whatever I would read about them, I would immediately note it down. So I had that idea that, okay, if I take it up later and I open that uh, page, everything will be fresh in my mind and I wouldn't get confused any further, right? Now questions come from, let's say, who belongs to which school? Prepare a list for yourself. This person, let's say you put it as philosophical school. You put it as, let's say, the analytical school or legal realism, whatever you do, right? Just beside that, you jot down the names of the uh, the 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 you know the proponents the chief proponents of these schools or let's say the people who belonged or subscribed to the to the understanding of these schools so you just keep the you just note the names of uh, these these uh, authors and jurists and the idea I mean what is what are they associated with right as I said uh, like like Erlich Erlich has come up with this concept of living law right so you just write uh, this is the sociological school, this is Ehrlich, and this is uh, the, you know, uh, the idea of living law. So you have everything in place, right? So before the exam, you just have to flip through the pages and see, because remember, people are not going to ask you, uh, you know, come up with the very idea of what Samund has said, or let's say what, I mean, not in great detail, 
just the basic understanding of that school and the theory propounded by the concerned jurist would suffice for this exam. That's the reason I've been telling you, you need to study smart. You need to also study hard, but of course in a smart manner, which is very important for us. You need not be an expert. Realize the fact that you need not be an expert, but you need to know everything. Right now I come to, let's say, uh, concepts like legal rights. Concepts like legal rights, you have so many different kinds of legal rights, rights in REM, rights in personum, uh, or let's say, uh, you know, I mean, different, different varieties of legal rights, just jot them down. One, two, three, four. So this versus this, this versus this, right? So you have this entire structure ready before you that this is, let's say, uh, uh, you know, as I said, right in REM, right in personal. The features, features, right? You close that thing, right? So a tabular format would be easier for you. So similarly, possession, concepts like possession, or let's say legal duties, right? The theories of, of legal rights, the theories associated with legal duties, just small little points because you have read it, you know what is there in the points, right? You need not make it for anybody else. So that is how you go about. So uh, I think with regard to jurisprudence, I think, uh, okay, one more thing that is, let's say with jurisprudence or any subject for that matter, pick up the, you know, the most basic uh, kind of book that, that you can think of and, uh, you need not uh, go very deep into it. As I said, you did not pick up uh, books which have tremendous amount of uh, discussion, which are, let's say, you know, which, which actually take you through a lot of, uh, you know, nuances. You need not do that, right? Just the basic understanding of the concept. Now, let's say if you, if you uh, read certain books for a basic understanding, so I was reading the book, uh, let's say if you pick up Vidi Mahajan, right? It is, it is available to everybody. So you pick up Vidi Mahajan, you pick up Dias on jurisprudence, right? Or let's say you pick up Salmond on jurisprudence. You take up uh, a textbook on jurisprudence by Peyton, right? Who edited this book uh, published by, I think, Oxford. So these books are basic books covering all these topics. And these would help you understand the things better in a much more simplified manner. You don't have to, because if you want to read about, let's say, analytical school alone, you have the entire book written by, uh, let's say, Austin. Or if you want to read about, so re there is no dearth of literature, but you have to understand your purpose. Your purpose is to clear this paper, right? So wh whatever little is required, you can do that because you have many other subjects to cover. Now, coming to another important uh, subject, which is my, uh, specialization and I uh, that is the most I mean closest to my heart uh, that is constitutional law so when you read constitutional law see constitutional law I think there are numerous questions that are asked from constitutional law now starting with let's say you might think that okay it's so huge it is so uh, you know it's extremely vast how do I go about starting my uh, preparation on constitutional law so what you have to do is again pick up the most basic book that is available, right? It can be VD, I mean, it can be uh, MP Jain, it can be VN Shukla, any book of your choice, right? You pick it up and you look at the question. Again, go back to the same format. Which question has come from which place? Now, let's say from the fundamental rights chapter, these are the questions that have come. So you just enumerate those questions. Don't write, you know, just the four options. No, don't do that. So if I say that, uh, let's say, uh, this thing happened by this amendment. So you just, you know, by which amendment? So the answer is this change took place by this amendment. Right to education, let's say, was incorporated by virtue of, let's say, there are four options given to you. you in, the, in the note that you prepare, you don't have to include on the four options. You can just mention 86th constitutional amendment. That is it, right? So prepare a list of amendments that have taken place in the constitution. So just give it a read because you might at any uh, moment see a question that what change was brought by which amendment. So that's again a very interesting way of putting it. Or let's say how many schedules are there in the constitution? What are the components of the three lists that we have under the seven schedule, right? I mean, how are they connected? Let's say 245, 246 of the constitution. How are they linked to the three lists, right? That uh, are there in the three. I mean, I mean, in the in the seventh schedule to the constitution. What is there in the 
Now, randomly, they give you a concept, let's say an entry, they give you an entry and they say, uh, this entry is there in which of the three lists, right? So don't get confused, just, just go through it, right? Look at the broader uh, domains, right? So if you look at the union list, it starts with so many things relating to defense. So anything relating to defense, you see, and you will automatically click on union list. So this understanding, this process is very important, right? So, and one, the most important thing about constitutional law or cracking constitutional law uh, questions is that don't read anything in isolation. That is today, if you think that I'm going to read, uh, let's say, uh, if I give you a case, let's say Manika Gandhi. So you read Manika Gandhi in the context of Article 21 and you close your book. Don't do that. Look at the previous cases, the precedents, right? And the subsequent decisions that have come after Manika Gandhi. Look at AK Gopal, right? Where we had a positivist mindset and the way we looked at procedure established by law. And we said that, no, we are going to adopt the procedure established by law model, unlike the American idea of due process, right? About uh, the American due process model. And we did not want to have uh, so much of power being vested in the in the unelected set of judges, right? So that was the reason why we had a case like A.K. Gopalan. Thereafter, we have seen the case of Manika Gandhi, whereby we have seen the idea of due process gradually started coming into the concept or let's say in the, in the framework of the Indian constitution. Gradually, we went ahead and so many things opened, right? In this context, you can learn about public interest litigation, you can uh, learn about the writ jurisdiction. What are the cases? We have seen several cases which indicate the importance of Article 21. And there are so many domains of it. Let's say custodial violence. Let's say environmental litigation. Let's say, uh, uh, let's say labor laws, right? So you demarcate. And that trajectory, starting point till the end, the present day development, that trajectory has to be clear. You need not be an expert again, let me tell you. You need not be an expert and you need not be like, okay, I'll finish from here till here and I will know everything because that will take you a lifetime and it will take you a very long time. Trust me, it's not a lifetime. Don't do all that. These are the important cases. This is the ratio of the case. This is the reason this case is famous for. If you take up Keshavananda Bharti, don't read Keshavananda Bharti in isolation. Look at the starting point. Look at Shankari Prasad. Right? Look at Sajjan Singh, look at Golaknath, look at Keshvananda Bharti, look at Minerva Mills, right? And then finally continuing till the present day application of basic structure, let's say the NJC uh, 2015 judgment. So that trajectory in constitutional law or any law for that matter, that trajectory should be there in front of your eyes. That it has started from here, it ends still here. And again, let me repeat, you need not be an expert, right? So that is constitutional law. Now, another important thing that I used to kind of follow uh, meticulously is because see, not all of us are experts in remembering things, uh, you know, at least when it comes to the sections or articles or uh, things like it. it's very difficult, very difficult, the year of the case. So in that case, what you can do is there are a few important uh, statutes or some important, let's say from uh, international law, right? Uh, if you are studying international law, uh, make sure that you study the UN Charter, you study the uh, ICJ statute, you study the, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the, the different conventions, of course, international humanitarian law is also a part of it. So from international humanitarian law, please make sure that you study about all these, uh, you know, instruments that are there, starting with UDHR, the two different uh, covenants, right, the, the, the optional protocols, Right? Just do one thing, take the bare provisions, not explanations, right? Bare provisions, those 30 provisions from UBHR, learn them, just walk and learn, read it on your own, right? The moment you start reading it on your own, you will see that gradually after 10 days of practice, and you have to compile them, let's say you have the UBHR first, then you have the UN Charter, you have the, or let's say you have the UN Charter, the ICJ Statute, the UBHR, the ICCPR, ICESCR, Convention on, uh, let's say, Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, uh, let's say the uh, Convention on Child Rights, 
uh, on refugees, etc., etc. So you compile them, just the bare text of them, right? Not books, bare text of them. And every day, if possible, just give it a reading, right? Just give it a bare reading. I mean, you don't have to be like, okay, this section says this, this article, you know, just give it a bare reading and see which provision has what. Basically, it talks about what, right? Because I also have seen questions coming, I mean, from the perspective of, let's say, with General Assembly, uh, let's say, resolution has introduced this. So it is very, very difficult for us to remember those exact numbers and all of that. It is very difficult. But again, right, we have questions also where probably they say that this article of the UN Charter talks about what. So immediately it should come to your mind that, okay, this is how you make stories, you make poems, you make whatever you make. But you have to remember these things by, I mean, at any cost. Sa same goes with statutes like Sale of Goods Act. Of course, with contract, with uh, law of thoughts. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't ask you to do anything like this because that would be dangerous because you might get proper questions, case law based questions from contract or let's say torts or let's say uh, several other uh, subjects. Don't do all that, but at least the ones which are statute based, right? Let's say uh, sale of goods act, right? Or, or let's say motor vehicles act. Just take the bare provision with you. Just go through them because at times the questions are very, very straight to the point, right? And you will have to do another thing, people, which I would again suggest you to do. And that is pick up the most basic book that you have on these subjects. You need not go for a very high level, uh, you know, study or in-depth study about these things, not required, not required because you are not specializing in this. Let's say you have your own specialization. You are a specialized person, let's say in commercial laws. You might not know everything about constitution. Or let's say you are specialized in public law, you need not know everything about environment, right? But you need to know the basics so that you can clear this particular thing. So coming to the, uh, you know, another important uh, area of law, and that is, that has been incorporated presently, that is uh, the comparative public law uh, idea. So I was just looking into the uh, syllabus that you have for comparative public law. Now see, they have identified very interesting jurisdictions. Somewhere they are talking about US, which is, I've seen, I mean, it is there invariably there in all these concepts, like for example, judicial review, right? So judicial review, look at judicial review, how it started in US. Look at the case of Marbury versus Madison. Now, if you want to study more about the US constitution, the ones who are preparing for these exams, I think there's this website called heritage.org. This website gives you detailed information uh, I mean, there are small little paragraphs explaining the concepts of uh, American law to, uh, I mean, these explanations are provided by uh, several professors of law from different esteemed universities. So they give certain explanations that what is meant by this provision of the American constitution. So that heritage.org will be a good guide for all of you. So you can refer to that. Similarly, if you want to read about Marbury versus Madison, there are several, see, if you want the information, there are thousands of sources. It's just that you need to figure out, right? If somebody wants to have a detailed idea about constitution, right? About constitution, if you want to have a detailed idea, as I said, uh, VN Shukla, MP Jain. And there is another important book, which is again, a very, very extraordinary development in the field of uh, constitutional law. That is the Oxford Handbook of the Indian Constitution. If anyone can read it, I don't think you need anything else to understand the constitution. It is so very good, right? Similarly, I was talking about comparative public law. You can also refer to, there's a book, I think, which is dealing with comparative public law. Uh, and we had it for our LLM. It was by Peter de Cruz, right? Uh, this book by Peter de Cruz, which deals with comparative public law particularly. It talks about various things like types of jurisdictions, like we have religious ju jurisdictions and, and uh, you know, uh, I mean, what kinds of government we have. We have a parliamentary form of government. We have a presidential form of government. So, so you can refer to those books, right? Uh, you can also uh, go and do some research in Google Scholar, right? Google Scholar is a platform which gives you links to very, very important sources. So those sources are very important for you. You can just quickly take a look, click on those papers and just, just you know, give it a reading, maybe 20, 30 pages articles. So just quickly give it a reading and it will give you all the information about any topic that you want to learn about, right? 
so uh, that is let's say comparative public law now for example there are places like i mean issues like uh, judicial independence right how are judges appointed right so they have let's say us they have south africa or let's say they have india right so let's say in south africa they want to talk about judicial independence now interestingly there are so many facts that that will come your way so let's say for example when the constitution of south africa was made uh, it was an entire process right and it was the constitutional court of south africa which had given a ratification before there was an interim constitution the constitutional court of south africa gave a ratification that see these are the provisions which we think are problematic then finally when it was adopted in the final constitution uh, you know they considered the opinion expressed by the constitutional court you can imagine how important the constitutional court of south africa is because they have just revived from the ruins that they were reduced to right because of the apartheid movement so this entire process how judges are appointed in these jurisdictions in us how is a judge appointed right they are appointed for life so how many judges are there in us everything is just a click away but you just need to have that hunger in you don't take it as a random exam and then don't take it as a random exam whatever you do do it with a lot of love do it with a lot of dedication it's not about you know because whatever you learn people this is just a small uh, suggestion because i've already come to the end of my discussion today it's a small suggestion that whatever you do do it with a lot of love because law specifically because my lecture uh, is is absolutely or let's say it is it is dealing with law and legal affairs so what i feel is that if you are preparing for anything please ensure that you are absolutely dedicated because tomorrow when you stand and teach the children right you don't know how you will be able to collect things probably you will be collect connecting things from comparative public law with certain things of constitutional law or let's say you'll be connecting constitutional law with certain elements of environmental law so you don't know but again then you will be thanking yourself for the amount of devotion you have shown at the time of preparing for ugc net you'll be like okay thankfully i had done it back then so i'm able to speak so much about about so many i'm i'm able to link so many things together so these are some preliminary things that i wanted to share with you people now uh, if there is any other uh, i mean anything else that you want me to talk about i think I'll, i would request the uh, host to take it up thank you so much ma'am ma'am with that we have actually received some uh, questions uh, we'd like to take the questions one by one so the first question is once the exam is cleared does it make the candidate eligible to secure a job with the government universities see it is you become eligible exactly you become eligible but that doesn't confirm that you are going to be selected for that post right because you that is the eligibility criteria right it's the eligibility criteria and once you clear this paper you are eligible to go and apply in any university whatsoever across the country that yes i want to apply for the post of an assistant professor or let's say a lecturer whatever uh, maybe the name but it's the eligibility criteria okay ma'am and the next question is are candidates after theory pg diplomas eligible for the ugc net or the master degree is compulsory see generally we understand that master degree is compulsory because uh, pg diploma that you have to check with the respective universities right you have to check with the uh, respective universities whether uh, that is recognized or not right uh, or let's say you have to check with uh, the ugc as well there are certain guidelines also that are get given there so you have to check whether your diploma has got the equal uh, status with that of a masters degree or not so i think that is that that you can check but ideally speaking masters degree is a must with 55 percent marks uh, ma'am the next question is will distance education be acceptable for ugc net see again uh, as far as i know uh, distance uh, if it's a distance course and if it is a masters again it has to be accepted but if it is anything else then probably you have to check with them but as long as it is your masters degree right even if it's a distance one i think i think that should be considered 
Now the next question is: As you know, revision is the ma uh, main factor for the success in UGC NET law exam, and candidates usually wake up one or two months before the exam for preparation. What was your preparation or the revision uh, revision strategy for the part two? See, when I started preparing for this particular exam, it was long, long because back because I told you I cleared it in my third attempt, and I was like, I mean, it was with utmost frustration that I ended up, uh, you know, I mean. Uh, going to the exam hall but i felt that you know what the best thing i mean the thing that helped me the most was the interaction that i had with some of my juniors who were back then preparing for flat so i used to help them learn the subject because in the process of learning it with them i had to give my own inputs so to teach them or to discuss with them i had to adopt my own strategy so i had everything noted down in my paper or page and i used to take print outs let's say from those things that i typed out in the computer and later on you know i mean before uh, the final exam that i had uh, i mean when when i cleared the paper uh, i technically took a five days break from my work where i was working and uh, it was during those five days that i prepared and uh, it was possible only because i had this habit of uh, learning with with those uh, let's say uh, children who were there with me who used to you know whom i used to teach clat basically so it was just like a discussion kind of a thing i learned a lot from them and i tried helping them with the learning process so i think you can try i mean the ones who are aspiring for this can try teaching some students who are let's say in the llb course or anybody anybody right rather than reading it on your own or let's say uh, doing a, a kind of a monotonous study and trying because it's very difficult to focus you can try teaching somebody right the moment you have that responsibility on your shoulders you become much more responsible and you try to deliver yourself in the most perfect manner so i think that can be a good strategy but revision when it comes to revision i think if you have your notes ready if you have all the details notes i am not i don't mean to say that you need to have all the notes written in volumes no just the points right because everything is there in your mind you just need to look at the points that's how i think that's the best way of revising uh, ma'am the next question is during the uh, time duration between clearing ugc net law and grf a candidate might get anxious what will you suggest is better clearing both ugc net and grf in one go or planning to as them one after the other see it's i mean experts there are some experts who say of course i am not an expert and i'm i have very little knowledge on this but what i feel is if you are if things are fresh in your mind and if you go for your first attempt i think it's always justified that you apply for both in whichever attempt it may be because ultimately if you don't end up getting a grf you ultimately end up getting a net so that will not i mean not qualifying for the will not take away your net from you right though you have to apply for both but it is just the cut off that matters so if it's let's say uh, uh, 70% which is for prescribed for grf but what is there for net is let's say 65% so ultimately you end up scoring 65% if not 70% so you are qualified for net if not grf right so i think but if those people who also want to go for grf at a later stage right if they think that no i'm not very happy with net i also want to go for grf so they can put in a bit of more effort right they can take a bit of time because this the first exam will kind of serve as a kind of a lesson uh, to them so they'll be able to understand the pattern and people one more thing that is very important is you try to check see this this analysis is very important in the past let's say 10 years what kind of questions have come try to look at and assess those questions that in the past 5 years questions have come from this place so it is less likely of course there, there's no straight jacket formula for this is just you know my understanding so you just do a basic research see from where the questions have come and then gradually you kind of you know focus on those portions which haven't come along with the portions that have already come because ultimately you are like okay it has come from here only so i don't have to bother and ultimately when you end up uh, being in the exam hall you see that all new stuff uh, you, you you i mean you are being asked so so you'll find yourself in trouble 
So just that analysis is very important. At least past 10 to 15 years question papers. Very, very important. Yes. And the next question is, what is the cap on the number of attempts regarding the exam? There's no limit. As many times, whatever may be your age, as many times, but I think with respect to JRF, there is an age bar, I think, probably. But not with negligence. Uh, Ma'am, this all questions we had. So I would like to move on the vote of thanks. I, on the behalf of Lex Auxilium and Dust Corpus, would like to deliver the vote of thanks. I would like to uh, thank Mrs. Satyani, ma'am, for taking out the time and accepting our invitation to conduct this session. I would also like to thank the participants who have joined us for the session. Uh, thank you so much and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.